I wanted to write a piece about um, Muslim pirates, barbaric infidels, or roadblocks to Western imperialism. Wow, well, wait. <laughs> so I had a few questions which I sent you. Um, oh, the ones that you sent me, yeah. Yeah, if I could ask you those, if, if that's sure, okay. I actually a good question because Arabic there is no actual word in Arabic for that what they used was mujahideen mm. or you know they they saw themselves as warriors uh you know warriors for god I mean pirates are pirates they're kind of maritime thieves they're they're robbers and they're basically trying to you know make money mm. either by looting or by capturing uh, individuals having them ransomed or putting them to work. I mean, both sides of the Mediterranean are doing the same thing. And there is no difference in terms of treatment. I mean, a pirate is, by definition, when he seizes, when they seize people, they're not going to be nice to them. Well, the whole Mediterranean had always been, you know, pirate infested. And of course, there are always issues of conversion, mm -hmm. much more in on the Christian side than the Islam Muslim side, so simply because they had better institutions for conversions. I mean, Muslims also are very eager to convert the captives. The accounts will show you different angles. I mean, sometimes they're very, very kindly captors. Sometimes, you know, they're vicious. And but that's on both, is, is that on both sides? Yeah, that's, that's very true. But It comes across that the Europeans and the English were worried about all these Christians converting to Islam. It depends on the period. Early in the late 16th, early 17th century, yes, the numbers were pretty, you know, scary yes. <laughs> for, you know, their home folks and, and back at home. Pirates um, in the Muslim world, were they around since the Prophet's time? Muslim powers, I mean, again, depending on the period, I'm the, the prophetic period, the Rashidun period, uh, I mean, until they develop a fleet. I mean, the Arabs are living in, in the desert. I mean, Mecca yeah. and Medina are, you know, way far from the from the sea. So and it develops much more by, you know, after, you know, as a result of the Crusades. I mean, it was one way in which kind of they, you know, they tried to fight off Crusaders. But by that time, everybody kind of was indulging in piracy. I mean, it was, yeah. you know, an easy way to make money. The main kind of the high season if you want mm. is medieval late medieval early modern and then you know it's taken as an excuse by the french to attack algiers in 1830 saying mm. that we want to end piracy by which time you know north african piracy was very 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 limited because you know by 1830 i mean the fleets of europe were by far more powerful by far more sophisticated by far more advanced in their uh, you know military technology than North Africans. I mean, it was an excuse for colonization yes. rather than eradication of piracy. In terms of captivities, yes, mm -hmm. there are always captivities as a result of wars. I mean, whenever you had wars and skirmishes, yes. captives would be taken. And even as far back as what, the 9th century AD, there are records of exchanges of captives between Muslim armies and Byzantine armies. Mm. But that was in terms of land wars. I mean, the, the Muslims were never powerful at sea. They never developed that kind of presence. It was, so yeah. they didn't really have very powerful fleets, but you don't have the kind of fleets that, could, that the Venetians had, which can carry mm. thousands of men, carry trade, carry kind of all sorts of exchanges between the two. Is, is that why the European world were worried about these Western pirates that were then coming to help the, the Muslims and with the bringing the technology and the skills? So the Western pirates were then converted. And yeah, I mean, that was there. There were many cases of uh, technologies being transferred. And I don't know how far we can, the claim can be made is that you know, without these technologies, without these assistances by these converts, these renegades, as we call them, uh, how far that could have, how far, you know, maritime activities by North Africans would have gone. They did bring their own, you know, maritime technologies and knowledge 
uh, with them. How far, as I say, it's kind of very difficult to evaluate whether, you know, they, you know, North Africans have done it on their own or not. Mm. Uh, the other side of that is, of course, the Ottomans were very, very powerful. They had fantastic navies. But the Ottomans looked at, and I focus on the North African side because that's the Arabic speaking side. And the Ottomans, as I say, had fantastic navies with native technologies, but they never shared them with these kind of regions, which they viewed as their backwaters. They were extremely developed and were a danger to Europe. Why they never shared that technological knowledge or military knowledge with the North Africans. And of course, Morocco was not under their control. So again, you know, Morocco is kind of, you know, in terms of population, had the larger population, uh, you know. So that's why, in a sense, that kind of geographical region is, is kind of on its own. As technology changes, uh, the North Africans don't have the kind of artillery mm -hmm. that, and, and firepower, basically, that the Europeans develop. I mean, the Europeans, you know, the British, the French, they can come and bomb a city like Algiers, a city like Tripoli, which they did, mm. and basically kind of, you know, destroyed completely. And that's what I say, you know, why didn't the Ottomans give them the kind of technology that they could have used? I don't know if they would, but they could have used in mm. terms of defense. So they had to get it from those... A little bit. A little bit. It's I mean, they could, never, they could never develop the industry as mm -hmm. well as the Europeans. If the Europeans were so superior in that field, then why were these um, Muslim pirates, Barbary corsairs, such a threat? Or it appears that they were a threat. Well, it's a threat to the commercial companies. I mean, you know, imagine if you're running a commercial company from London or from uh, Lyon or from, and basically it's France and Britain. I mean, by, by the early modern period, these are the two superpowers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, imagine if you're running a commercial company and, you know, your ship, which you've lay, you know, you've loaded with all sorts of goodies, going, let's say, to, to Istanbul, gets captured mm -hmm. by the pirates who loot it, who take it. Yeah. Uh, so it's not in terms of a danger as such. It's basically economic forces at work. I mean, the... At no point ever did North Africans have the capability to go and say, bomb Plymouth, you mm. know, in the way that the British did bomb, let's say, Tripoli. So that's um, interesting you say that because the Western narratives make out that it was a really big threat. And I wonder if that's part of this Islamophobic narrative around Muslims in general. Yeah, I mean, again, we need to look at when and where. I mean, they had, you know, they sailed up. I mean, they did take captives and, you know, an island, they reached island. Yeah. But I mean, you know, this, as I say, this was at this early stage after the middle of the 17th century, it declined. It's not like they stopped doing that. I mean, there are lots of small ships that were sailing on their own. They get captured with kind of 10, 12 people. Uh, mm. But so in a sense, it. and then these people go back, they tell their stories or they write their stories. Mm. That's, I think, the main difference is yeah. that they write and publish because they want to make some money. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they, they return and they're helpless because, you know, if they've spent five or 10 years in captivity in Tunisia or whatever, you know, they, they've lost all that they had. I mean, even mm -hmm. their families may have deserted them or whatever. So some, some of them would, would even have ghost writers kind of write mm -hmm. their accounts and, you know, hopefully make some, you know, profit of it. And so, yeah, that will build up the image, the anti, you know, you know, the Barbary cause, the kind of, you know, the, the, the anti-Muslim image, definitely. I think the other point, I, if you look at my book, British Captives in North Africa, because that book was a reaction against a very, 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 very popular book that had appeared maybe like 10 or 11 years earlier. Mm. And that book was a very, in my view, very bigoted, mm. but it became very popular because it appeared just after 9-11. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore there was this, you know, zeal to demonize Islam and Muslim. And he came up with a book arguing, it's, his name is Robert Davis, and he made the claim 
uh, that between like 1450 and maybe like 1800, that North African pirates, Muslim pirates, he, he uses that by far more frequently. As I say, it had an ideological bigoted kind of angle. Yeah. Uh, he, wanted, he argued that there were a million uh, Christian captives in North mm -hmm. Africa, that they were seized by Muslims, a million. Yes. And he's trying to, you know, I mean, it was an angle he wanted to push and it got pushed. Mm -hmm. It was very popular. It got on the BBC, but it gave me the idea. I'm going to do what he had not bothered to do. I'm going to look at one country, which was Britain, because yeah. I knew it well and I knew the archive. And I'm going to count how many captives are mentioned by name. I did that. And my argument was, you know, this idea of a million captives is totally outrageous. Yes. And cannot be supported by the evidence. Yeah. yeah. That I think is definitely yeah, the sounds... source of this very hostile discourse. I mean, yeah. The objective of ca capturing, cap I mean, taking captive yeah. is either to put them to work, so it's free labor, or to have them ransom, which means you get some cash. Yes. But the Europeans were doing that, the Maltese were doing that, the French yeah, were doing exactly. that. The French were the last kind of large keepers of captives. I mean, they had the largest number into the late 17th century, early 18th century. Well, so, this uh, is the other thing I wanted to ask you was um, sometimes they were working for the empires. So like Barbarossa is working for the Ottomans and then you have the Knights, the, the yeah, Knights, that, that, they that, in Rhodes first and then they were pushed out of Rhodes yeah. to Malta, but they were working uh, for Christendom. Yeah, 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 for the papacy, basically so, for the papacy. Yeah. So was there like a blurred line between this privateering, but also working for the empires? Like even Sir Walter Raleigh, wasn't he supposed to be a pirate? Oh, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. But he didn't come into the Mediterranean. He yeah. was out in the on, in the Atlantic and later yeah. went into the Pacific. Yeah, of course he was a pirate. And so was Francis Drake was a pirate. Francis you know? Drake, yeah. All these great men were pirates. Yeah. One empire's pirate is another man's like Mujahid. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the language that is used. I mean, as I say, you look at the hospital or knights, the knights of Jerusalem in, in Malta. I mean, they're priests, you know, mm -hmm. and they're clear. And so they're seen as defending Christendom. And on the Islamic side, on the North African side, the Muslim side, yeah, they're Mujahideen. You know, they're fighters for the cause. All of them are thieves. <laughs> it's, it's really part of the economy of that period in the Mediterranean. Because Barbarossa was, a, uh, the brothers were renegades, and then they were employed by the Ottoman Empire. So how does that work with the North African link? Was it separate? In the, that's a bit earlier. That's the kind of middle of the of the 16th century. Yeah. No, the Ottomans wanted some powerful presence, you know, after their conquest of North Africa. Mm. 1517, they conquered all of North Africa except Morocco. Yes. And of course, the Spaniards are not happy. The Italians, I mean, all Western Europe is not happy, mainly Spain and Italy, because they're the ones kind of closest in terms yeah. of the Mediterranean to them. So that's where the Ottomans kind of installed the Barbarossa brothers as kind of defenders. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, yeah, you, then you begin to have much more active piracy on their part, on the part okay. of North Africa. But by that time, Barbarossa brothers are dead. I mean. yeah. So it takes off on its own. And, you know, many of the North African ships would have, or in the fleet, would have so many captives who were renegades, who were mm -hmm. converts. And so converting, becoming Muslim, one sentence which Massive you probably difference. didn't understand yeah. what does it mean i mean you're just a pirate you're just right. making money and making a living and whatever it is do you think these pirates then were just barbarian infidels or were they playing a role in sort of pushing back western imperialism my argument is that this is the poor man's war that you know if you don't have the you know sophisticated technology of war the only way you can fight back is what they did mm. but they they were fighting back in a way but it was totally unsuccessful yeah and eventually happened anyway yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody moved in everybody yeah moved in, the french and the italians and yeah you guys the british as well <laughs> yes 